Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the incredible documentary, Giving Voice. On behalf of the Virginia Film Festival and Jeff Wales, Associate Professor of Practice here at the University of Virginia and Artistic Director of Heritage Theater Festival, the professional theater at the university. And I'm thrilled to have the filmmakers and directors of Giving Voice with us today, James Stern and Fernando Vienna. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us and, uh, you know, and thank you for having a film festival, which is actually going and still vibrant. And, um, you know, and uh, uh, I, I was, a couple of years ago, I, I went and visited, you know, University of Virginia. It's a beautiful place and a beautiful campus and uh, we're, we're happy to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone's had to pivot in different directions mm -hmm. and, and kind of adjust to the new situation. So we're so thrilled that we can still share this incredible uh, film with our patrons and community members. I just watched this film. I was blown away. I was so struck by the heart and the hope and the humanity that you share with us as audience members. And one thing that was going through my mind is how different the mediums of theater and film are. And yet there's something that you've both encapsulated in that reflects the theatrical medium. And I'm just wondering how you approach those two different mediums and meld them together. How do you use your experience in theater to transfer it to film? How does that process work? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Fernando can jump in and, uh, and, and correct me. Um, but, uh, um, you know, when I was you know, I've spoken to a lot of, you know, schools and film schools and, you know, film schools that have theater programs. And I always say that you listen to theater and you watch film. And, um, and so that's, that's tricky. And, um, and in this case, obviously, um, the words were paramount, you know, for us in terms of, you know, uh, you know, telling the audience about Wilson, about his artistry, about his poetry, and also, um, at the same time, to show what the kids were learning. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we did, which was really beneficial, is that you only see bits and pieces of monologues until the end. Um, and so that, that way we, we keep people sort of engaged. Um, but, you know, something we definitely talked long and hard about, you know, and um, about how to do that. Bernie? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, great question. Um, I didn't grow up in the theater, right? I grew up watching movies and watching action movies and that sort of thing. And when I really, when I started going to theater, I realized that the thing that struck me was that, wow, it's just like one big wide shot, right? It's just like, and then so I would have to like, I'm, I'm gonna look at this person, I'm gonna look at that person, I'm gonna look at this object. So, so I find that to be the big difference between a movie and theater and then, you know, being able to punch in on a close-up of one of our actors doing a monologue is a really interesting thing because it does encompass the theater and does encompass the filmmaking uh, aspect of it. The other thing is for me is, um, is the rehearsal process in theater and film is totally different. There's, there's like, you're lucky if you have rehearsals in films, you know, and like these kids work on monologues for months and months and months and they really develop the character and they really um, bring them to life. It's so that there's, 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 those are the two differences that stood out for me. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that, I think that so much of your question is answered in the edit room. You know, but now, you know, Fernando's quite right. And it's also when you punch in, how you punch in, how you use it, what you're accentuating in the monologue and the kids um, and what you're not. At the same time, you have to be really mindful that it is theater. And so you do want to give, as, as Fern just said, you know, that, that master shot and the scope to it. And jumping off of that with the editing room, that, that was a question that I had because there's, there's so much concentration on the words and on Wilson's own musicality. There's a reference throughout the film to this idea of musicality, not only with Wilson's words, but with our own individual words, access to our own song and, and how be expressed and I'm wondering how the musicality of Wilson's words affected 
your internal rhythm and editing of the piece itself? It's a great question. Um, it's a complicated question. I, I think that there is, I think like an actor finds the rhythm um, and the, the ebb and flow and the arc in, in his monologues um, and, and the director finds that in, in, his, in his scenes that are not just monologues as well. I think that we and anybody who's putting this on film, I'm sure George C. Wolfe does this brilliantly in Maharani's Black Bottom, which is to come out on Netflix the same month that we come out. Um, I think that you have to be very conscious of that. And I think you have to be conscious of, I mean, how his words sit on top of each other, um, you know, musically. And I think that that's something, you know, we, we certainly were conscious of. Right, there's a specificity to what he wrote that even in the competitions, if you got one word wrong, they, they marked it, you know, and like you could potentially lose the whole thing because, of, because you weren't word accurate, right? Um, but as far as, you know, there's a certain kind of inherent rhythm to good editing, right? To get, you know, this pacing, it doesn't mean that it has to be super sped up or anything. It just has to feel right at the right moments. And for us, the musicality, you know, reading Wilson is different than like seeing Wilson. There's like, there's a, there's a musicality in, and a kind of lyricism to, 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 to the words, but unless you kind of grew up in that, in that environment and, and, and those were the kind of conversations you had, it's hard for you to kind of get that rhythm. And, you know, so a lot of it was new to me. And I remember like, like re the difference in reading it and then seeing the monologues performed. Um, I, the musicality came out in the performance a lot, of, a lot of times. So we were kind of wanted to make sure we focused on that. But then we had a great composer too. We knew we needed, we needed to find a great composer to help carry a lot of the monologues because um, you know we would be hearing them bits and pieces, uh, but still we would be hearing them throughout the film. So we wanted to keep it fresh. And um, uh, the composer that that we worked with was just spectacular and it's really cool because we didn't you know a lot of people work with temp score and they'd be like you know i'm gonna use this person's score for our offline edit and then the composer can like copy it but in our case the composer just wrote original score yeah the, comp the compositions really felt to me like another character in the film that that helped to guide you and and move you along in a way that you weren't even entirely aware of which i thought was 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 so beautiful yeah, Brian Setti is brilliant and, and a real, you know, and became a real partner to us. Can we talk about the competitors a little bit? We won't give anything yeah. away, but I'm, I'm so interested. We, you took us on such a journey with Freedom and Nia and uh, Cody and Gerardo and Aaron and Callie. And I'm wondering, how do you, in the beginning stages, start to identify who you're going to follow? And then how does that unfold as the process months it's really hard um you know and you know it was we we did we did a film um when we when we first started working together called every little step which was about the, um, the creation of a chorus line where um we had to follow a lot of actors you know through the process of auditions so i had to deal with it then as well this is even harder because at least with a chorus line movie it all take, <laughs> took place in the same city <laughs> this was all over the map um, the thing that we started with was we, we decided to, to, to feature a hero city. Um, so, um, so that became Chicago, which is, um, I don't know, I mean, it's where I'm from. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't, I don't remember, but it was, but you know, it's, um, but Chicago became the hero city. And then we sat there and, um, and then we, in the process of watching auditions, it, it did, certain people did jump out to us. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just, that's just a fact. I mean, you know, um, Nia, Cody, and Freedom were all Chicagoans. All three of them in the course of that Chicago audition all jumped out to us. Other people did as well. It's just that we can only follow so many, right? So, um, and then adding other cities, um, you know, we had a sense of who was really special um, as those, we didn't follow those other cities quite as early, early, but not, 
not from the very beginning. And so we were able to pick up a little bit of steam for Kelly, Aaron, and, um, and Gerardo. Um, and obviously, you know, Gerardo was easier because he was in Los Angeles and we were, and the other two were, were, were harder. But we, we definitely wanted to get a cross section of, of America, you know, in the, in the film. There's also an element of luck, right? Because um, um, uh, Freedom and Nia, like they're, they're very talented and they go to art schools and they go to theater schools and theater programs. Um, but, you know, we were able to discover or find Cody, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that allowed us to do a couple things. It allowed us to focus on somebody going through the process of learning how to give a monologue, of learning of like just, he, he was basically just um, beginning to learn the process when, when we turned the cameras on him. So um, we were able to experience how somebody um, finds their voice in theater because Nia and Freedom, they had already you know, been, been in the program. So they, they, for, for them, it was a different process. Um, so in a lot of ways, Cody was, you know, he's the heart and soul of the film because we we're able to, to um, go deeper with him in a lot of ways. And, and then that allowed us not to have to do that with everybody. We could just uh, focus on him in that, in that respect. That, that's a great point, and it's also a great point that Fern just made, which is that you got to get lucky. You know, I mean, these kids are absolutely magical. I mean, they're all really magical, and, you know, you, you can hope for that, but you don't know you're going to find that. And anybody who says that you don't need luck to make a, you know, a really terrific documentary is, is um, being, I think, uh, not completely, you know, honest with themselves. Um, you do, and, and we certainly did. And... And Fernando is completely right. You know, Cody represented in so many ways the kinds of experience that August Wilson was writing about also, which also allowed us to, um, because of that character, we were able to sort of save time in other ways from a, from a cutting and narrative standpoint. I found myself rooting for each of them whenever they were, they were, they were with us. And, you know, I wanted there to be 10 winners, eight winners, you know? And so I'm wondering for you personally, were there moments when you would, when you also were falling in love with the competitors themselves and, and rooting for them individually? Or, or is that, is, would that reveal too much to like <laughs> say you were rooting for one competitor or not? Because I found myself, the heart of the film kept moving for me as, well as you were sharing everyone's journeys with us as we were watching. Well, I, I, have, I, 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 have, I have two children and I love them both. And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> all I was hoping for is that one of our kids would win in the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, yeah. and, and Gerardo, wow, that last performance he does. Um, yeah, but, the, you know, and then Nia, just, it, wow, we got lucky. Luck, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of it is luck, but um, um, it, it was, um, you, you, you know, it's, talking about the winners, we didn't want to make a competition movie. We knew it was a competition film, but we, we were like committed not to follow down the path of like a competition film, you know, because there's certain things you, you need that those movies do, right? Um, so what, one of it was like, you know, it's not about who wins this competition or not. It's not about, it's not about winning because, you know, how really, do, you know, because like Viola says, and now what? Right. right. Yes. I loved that moment that the three words that, and now what? And now what? I just, just, yes. So we wanted, we wanted that to, to ring true. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, like Denzel says, it takes a lot of guts to get up there and do the, and do what these um, young people do and uh, young people did. And, and we wanted that to be the focus. And so I was, yeah, I was rooting for all the kids who I didn't even know, you know, it's just, it's just an incredible competition and an incredible um, uh, just, just event to celebrate his legacy, to celebrate August Wilson's legacy. Yes, absolutely. And another incredible actor who has uh, featured Stephen McKinley Henderson in the film shared with us the quote, uh, fearless revolutionary optimism. And when I was finished with the film that those three words kept washing over me as I was thinking this film is the encapsulation of fearless revolutionary optimism. And I wonder if you feel 
that way as well? And if so, how, 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 how does that, how does the idea of creating uh, an artistic work, a, a film that uplifts and shares these student stories is an act of fearless revolutionary optimism? Well, first of all, I think it's, you know, we started this film three years ago and you can't ever imagine how, um, when something comes out, especially documentary, which is so much about the now, um, what's going to be going on in the world, which is either going to work in counterpoint to you or it's going to work in concert with you. And in this case, it's obvious and clear that it's worked, you know, in such stark concert with us that, you know, that, that we need as a culture, as, you know, in the, in, in the world is, you know, is fearless optimism. And, you know, and I think it's, you know, revolutionary in, in the sense that, you know, of, of that, um, that artists particularly need to sort of be at the forefront and, and you know, and taking risks. So I, I think that that's, I think it really is that, I think it is that for this time also. And I think that one of the things that I'm particularly so proud of is, um, you know, that this film shows people, you know, through the simplicity of something like, you know, uh, you know, arts program or a model of competition, but it also shows people who, you know, who people are, who these kids are, what, what the power of language is, what the power of writing is. And at this particular time, when there's so much obvious, you know, um, you know, polarization and, and, and anger and rage and, you know, you know, from, you know, on, on every, every which way in this world, this film, I think, is a real beacon. And I think that, you know, I think we also got very lucky. I know you didn't ask this, but the closing credit song was called Never Break, which John Legend wrote for this movie before everything broke apart, which is also pretty amazing. And, um, you know, so it all comes together. And, you know, and I think in that case, we got, you know, we're, we're really lucky we were able to do this film at this time. Yeah, I think it's a revolutionary act to express joy as a, as a great point. black person, as a brown person in these, in these days, in these times, especially um, just with the, the general atmosphere. Um, and I love that about the film. And I love that these kids just, just are pursuing their dreams and pursuing um, their, their ambitions, just like, but full of joy and full, and full, full of like wonder. And I think that's, I, I do think that's a revolutionary act. And also like really quickly, the fearless revolutionary, fearless revolutionary optimism. How cool is it that Freedom is watching Juilliard commencement speeches on YouTube? Like, like, I mean, that, like that's how committed that, that, that he is. He's like, he loves theater, he loves acting. And he watches, he watches those commencement speeches on YouTube like other people watch like football highlights, right? Like that's his thing, you know, and I love that. I love that commitment, I love that that passion he has for, for theater. And um, all those kids express it in different ways, you know, and, I, and that, that was one of the, one of the coolest ways I, I thought that, you know, was shown in the film. Yes, absolutely. I think there was something for me as I was watching it that that idea of connection and joy and um, allowing language to express are fully and truly that, that we are in a place right now where we're connecting over boxes like this. You know, we, we see each other, we're connecting with each other, we're having this conversation, but there was something so beautiful about revisiting that power of in-person connection that theater gives us and that theater really an exploration of how our shared humanity can be felt and seen. Um, and and it, I think that's one of the reasons why it was just so incredibly moving to me uh, to, to have a window back into that world. I think everyone's pivoting as best as they can in this, mo in this moment and still trying to create those ways of connection, but it was, um, it was really beautiful to see that. And this is, this is such a love letter to emerging artists and to our past. Who are the artists who came before us and how does their influence impact our own 
individual journeys. And if you have pieces of advice for emerging filmmakers in this moment that would that would that you'd like to share. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that they'll be a little bit different, but you know, uh, to to steal from Fern a little bit, um, you know, I think that. Um, we, we don't really worry about what other people are going to think of something. Mm. And, and I think that that's maybe the most important thing. I think we we're very good at worrying about what we're going to think of something. So, um, and, and I think that that's, that I think can get lost, you know, is that people can, to, can say, well, who's the, who's the audience going to be? Right. And, you know, and obviously doing a, a film about a monologue competition that might seem at first blush limited, but, it doesn't, it's not, depends on what, you know, I remember a long time ago, you know, I was asked to produce a show where people made, you know, noise out of found objects. And I was asked to do it because everybody in the world that thought it was a joke in the past, and it turned out that that was Tom. So, um, you know, so you can't, as filmmakers, nobody knows. So what I would say is if you have a story that seems important to you, then it's worth pursuing. I, w I think that's absolutely right. Um, I would, from my from my perspective and my my um, my history, there's there's a couple things. You know, first I have to learn to trust my gut, trust my instincts. It's really important as a filmmaker. It's really important in, in everything you do, really. But I had to go through that process. The other thing is like, I have to not. I have to stop worrying about where I was in relation to other people as far as time. Like, well, this person was here by 30 and I'm still doing this. And so it's like, forget that. Just, just learn the craft, do the work, whatever it is that you're doing and really try and do it to the best of your ability um, because it all kind of plays itself out, right? And then, and, then, um, and then just really don't care about what people think. You, you, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like it's like that goes along with trusting your gut. It's like, it's like um, you, you know, do it for yourself. Do it, do it for your friends. You just, but it's not like uh, have that. Well, what are people thinking about me? Voice in your head. That's never gonna work. So forget about time. Trust your gut and get rid of that voice in your head. Yeah, it reminds me actually of what Wilson said about your own song that we all have it. We just have to tap into how we sing it. And I feel exactly what both of you are saying is how can you tap into who you are and what you want and what's going to make the biggest impact for you yeah how so how is what was the genesis of the idea like how you know when you're talking about find a, find something you want to commit to and move forward with that project even come to be what were initial conversations so um what happened was that uh, that um, that uh, the August Wilson Estate is is um, was looking for, and Costanza Romero, who is his widow, was looking for someone to do. Um, she thought it'd be a great idea to have someone do a documentary on the on the Mala competition, and she was given every little step, which was the prior prior film that we had worked on. Um, uh, about the creation of Chorus Line, which does follow some of the same narrative. It's very different, but at the same time, there's kids, you know, there's people auditioning, there's a central figure who's a creative giant, in that case, Michael Bennett. And she saw the film and she loved it. And so she actually asked me if I would talk to her about August Wilson, who I was a huge fan of. I come from the theater originally. I had seen Fences when I was a kid on Broadway. You know, I mean, so I mean, I go all the way back with Wilson. So I went up to Seattle and spent a day with her and talking about her husband and about, you know, and, and I, and as soon as she had called me, I talked to Fernando and, and he said right away, it's, it's a great idea if there's a way to do it and not make it just a competition movie. So I, you know, paired that idea to her and she was, super on board and that's that's but it was really it really came from her and the fact that she'd seen prior work so that was that was a you know that was really fortuitous right and when we you know when we were like uh, we were telling people the idea for the film nobody thought a, a monologue competition film was going to like be all that interesting 
are all that exciting, right? Like, so monologue, they say that over and over and over again, like the whole movie, that sounds great. <laughs> Good luck with that, right? But we had, we, we thought it could work, you know, we thought it could work if we focus on the right, on the, on the right things. And uh, my, my, my entry point wasn't through August because I, I, I didn't, I hadn't, I hadn't seen a lot of his work or read a lot of his work before then. Um, I had fences in the piano lesson when I, when I, when I was younger. Um, mine was through acting because when I decided I wanted to direct after a 20 year editing career, I knew I had to learn how to, how to act because I worked, you know, I just thought that made sense. So I spent the last, well, now it's been a while, but I spent three years doing, you know, in a, in a Meisner course, like, you know, I just really went deep. And then when we, when this, when this opportunity came up, I decided it would be really great to really, to really explore the craft of acting. And, um, and then, and then, you know, I was introduced through, to August's work through making the film. So I have one last question for you both. So when, when we tackle projects, inevitably we're shifted a bit from the, how we were at the beginning of the project to the end of the project. Something about journeying through the project changes us in some way or shifts our, the way we're looking at the world or something about us personally or professionally. And I'm wondering for each of you, after giving voice, what is the thing that shifted for you or that will remain with you as a result of this journey with these incredible young people through the last three years? It's a, that's a great question also. Um, you've asked, asked really great questions. Um, uh, I think that, I mean, I think for me, I think I really fell in love with the kids. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, I'm, I, I, look, I, I think that I'm always, I think that I've always had a really strong view of, of the need for arts education in the country. It's always been a big thing. I was a theater kid, um, as well as basketball, but, you know, but theater, you know, took, took root. Um, and, um, and I think that if that wasn't available to me, then, you know, I would not have had my, my life would have been really different. Um, it was available to me, but you know, in today's world, it, it feels you know sometimes um, you know less so. And I think that that's that's you got to guard against that. And I think that you know there's there's real ways in which these things can make a difference. And um, and I think that the ways in which theater and the arts can help us communicate and talk to each other and listen to each other. And, you know, um, and you find people who are special and who are touched by things because they have, because they are given voice. And, and so I think that what I take away is, is, is the opportunity to have seen that first, you know, so close up. And, um, and it, for me, while I knew it, I think that it has touched me in a way which is, which is deeper than it was even before. Um, you, you have great questions, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Really awesome. um, um, I, 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 I was just struck by the resiliency of the, of the kids. And um, they're, really, they're really special and they really care. And I, I don't know if I, if I had that when I, when I was their age. In fact, I, I know I didn't. You know, I had to kind of find it later in life. And, and, and they, they have it in spades, you know, and, um, and I've gotten to know a couple of them pretty well and, but all of them left a mark on me. And, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about making a movie is that you meet great people. Sometimes it's the subject, sometimes it's people behind the camera. And, and um, that's a really great thing about making, making movies is just people that come to your lives, right? And, um, and they were great and they are great. And I'm really excited to see what they do. Because I think a few of them are gonna really pursue it <laughs> his career and, and um, they have a good, a good a shot as anybody, you know? They're very talented, so. And, and no matter what they do, they're gonna be great kids and they're gonna be great adults. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I know we're all rooting for them. And thank you both for sharing them with us. 
so that we can continue to go on that journey. James and Fernando, thank you so much for spending your time chatting about this incredible gift you've given us, right. Give Voice, which is going to be available for streaming on Netflix in December of 2020. I hope that everyone has a chance to watch this incredible film, whether you have a relationship to theater or not. It is truly a journey of the importance of the human spirit and language that can open um, things up for us. So thank you both for everything that you have done. And it's been such a, it's been a joy to spend time chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And your questions. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. <laughs>